Hi, my name is Sarah and I am a VTS in emergency and critical care at Dove Lewis and I want to talk to you real quick about troubleshooting ECGs. So we run ECGs all the time in veterinary medicine and it's actually one of the things that I know I was most intimidated about when I left school and I, I think I see the same in some of our newer graduates. And I just want to give you some of the tips that I've learned along the way that may help you um, figure out um, the difference between normal and abnormal in our pets. So when I'm looking at an ECG, one of the first things I'm looking for is to see if there is a P wave for every QRS and a QRS for every P wave. Sometimes that can be a little bit challenging to see. Um, the other thing that I'm looking for is that the intervals between these complexes are regular um, and that can help us determine if um, this rhythm is normal or not. And you may not always be able to see that early on, or you may see something, like I see a little bit of a wave in him every once in a while, and it's a little bit hard for me to tell if those are P waves or if that's motion um, or something else. So if you're not sure with what you're seeing on the screen, if that's normal or not, you do have the ability to look at different views. And that's one thing I think is really good to be comfortable with. So. I like to start on lead two. So for most of our like really basic uh, monitoring parameters, we're using a lead three, um, but these can go all the way up to lead 12 if you're going into the cardiology department and getting really fancy. Um, but we normally do lead three um, ECGs or three lead ECGs with, and I like to keep it on lead two because it gives you the biggest complex that's easiest to interpret. Um, but sometimes you may see things on one, on one view, but not on the other. So if I wanna confirm that something I'm seeing exists on other things, um, each monitoring parameter device is gonna be, multi-parameter device is a little bit different, but you can usually click and go to different leads. So if I wanna switch him to lead one, you can see that that looks a little bit different. And actually here I can't see P waves much at all. Every once in a while I think I see them. Um, so I may wanna see what it looks like on lead three as well. And there I can actually see a pretty clear P wave on each one of those, P, QRST, P, QRST, P, QRST. Um, so it's really nice. So actually that lead three gave me a good view, but generally speaking, start with lead two. The other thing you can change is the size of your QRS. Like if you, um, you know, are, are having, if it's really small, you're not getting a good image, you can change the size of this. I have this dog on uh, 0.5, um, but you can go up quite a bit higher. Let me see. So you can go and change that, make that really, really big. So on here, you can really see P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, and those P waves are a lot more visible on this waveform, um, but they can get a little bit too big and then stack on each other a little bit. So um, find something that you're comfortable interpreting. Um, and so when you understand normal, um, it's easier to understand abnormal. So if any reason, this to me looks like a normal sinus. Um, he does have a, like a sinus arrhythmia where you can see he has some closer QRSs and then they get a little wider apart and that's probably associated with his breathing. But if I really want to confirm that, printing a strip is the absolute best way to interpret um, a waveform because if you're looking at a PQRS and you're trying to figure something out, it disappears, right? A new one comes in or, and it's really difficult to actually measure to see if those intervals are regular. So if you have a device that prints a strip, I always try to do interpretations off of a strip um, to see, to recognize if it's truly normal or abnormal. So I'm gonna print a strip here for us to look at. I can tell the intervals by counting the number of squares between are fairly regular. Every once in a while they get a little wider and I, you know, that's probably a, a sinus arrhythmia on him, which can be normal in dogs, but it's really easy for me to identify that he has a P, Q, R, S, and T with each waveform, um, helping me rule out any arrhythmias. So, um, you know, kind of the big things, the takeaways here are switch, um, from between lead one, two, and three. If you're seeing something, see if it's replicated on the other ones. If it's replicated on each one, it might be real. Um, 
but it could be artifactual if it doesn't uh, stay persistent on each one. M identify whether there's a P wave for every QRS and a QRS for every P wave, and then identify if your intervals are regular or irregular, and that's a great place to start with. Um, one other tip I like to share with people is that um, having getting a good signal can be hard in some animals if they have really dense coats. So alcohol is really um, the best way to wet the fur and get conduction. But if you um, are worried about hypothermia, ultrasound gel works really, really well um, to create a, you know, give you a good waveform. And the thing I like about ultrasound gel, one, it doesn't you know, contribute as much to hypothermia as some of the other, you know, alcohol does, but it also doesn't dry as quickly. So if you have an ECG like this on a patient for many hours, ultrasound gel will give you a good QRS for a longer period of time. So that is the basics of interpreting an ECG.